Good morning to all of you. This is our monthly webinar. We're going to spend an hour together today and look at uh, some uh, more advanced capabilities in EMI-Scope called SDM or Structural Dynamics Modification. So welcome to all of you. This is Mark Richardson speaking from Vibrant Technology in Scotts Valley, California. And I have with me Brian Schwarz, who is managing uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you have an area on your screen where you can ask questions. So we want to be able to answer any questions you may have. We're going to cover a lot of material today. And so let's, uh, let's get into it right now. Uh, this is EmiScope on the screen, but before that, I want to bring up our help, which is online now. This is located at help.vibetech.com. So all of our help for EmiScope has been put online, and you can actually access it yourself uh, and look at what I have displayed on the screen here. So what I've gone to is tutorial number 13, and it's called Structural Dynamics Modification, or SDM. And I wanted to start off with this block diagram to explain to you how SDM works. Uh, it's very straightforward. Uh, it takes a modal model, or a set of mode shapes, from an unmodified structure, and then together with some modification elements attached to a structure model. Now these are the same as FEA elements, springs, masses, dampers, uh, plate elements, solid elements. I can use any of those type of elements that are available in EmiScope. And SDM solves an eigenvalue problem in modal space, so it's a little bit different than a, an FEA solver. Uh, it's very fast. We'll see in an example here in, uh, in a few minutes uh, how quickly it calculates the modified modes. And in EmiScope, we call them the new modes. So when we calculate new modes, those are the modes of the modified structure with the modification elements attached to it. So the whole idea of SDM is to very quickly uh, take a modal model, a set of mode shapes, and look at how those mode shapes are changed by the influence of uh, various elements that we add to the structure. So if I'm looking at adding stiffeners, or adding dampers, or adding mass, or tuned absorbers, uh, or doing substructuring, uh, we're going to look at some of these things today, especially the substructuring, using SDM to attach several objects together by using their, their modes, which represent the dynamics of each of the objects. So let me put that down, and we're going to go back here. Now, I've arranged three uh, demos. You can see I have a tab up here called October 2015 Demos, and I've got three projects up here one called the Jim Beam SDM, the next one is called the VTEC Expand 3 Speeds, and then a third one called VTEC SDM Substructuring. So we're going to use each of these projects to look at how SDM can be used to do uh, substructuring and also to look at modifications uh, to the Jim Beam. So let's open this one first. Now, the other thing that's going to be used here quite a bit, and I'll go into some of the details, but not all of them, are uh, hotkeys and macro programs. So once we have set up a macro program with some hotkeys, and here's the hotkeys right up here on the, on the, key, on the, uh, the toolbar, the, the, uh, actually the, the menu bar, and you can see that I've got one called one spring, two springs, four springs, and then a flip sign. So these are hotkeys that I've defined in this project that will execute macro programs 
and we'll see in a minute how how that works and then we'll go in and take a look at how those commands uh, were put together in a macro program any command in emiscope can be added to a macro program but let me start the animation here and uh, you can see my my animation source over here is EMA modes. So these are some mode shapes that we got from curve fitting some uh, FRF measurements uh, on the gem beam here. So this is one of the mode shapes. I'm going to hit the arrange for animation and now I can see the shape table over here on the top. This is my EMA modes and as I click on each of the shapes we can see uh, the different mode shape. Now I also have the point labels turned on so that we can see uh, the test points on this photo model, this gem beam. You can see there's 33 test points and uh, the way we did this test was with an impact hammer but we impacted only at the outer edge of the upper plate at point 15 here in the Z direction. And then we moved a triaxial accelerometer around. Obviously, we had to have triaxial data in order to look at this mode shape here because its dominant motion is in the, in the uh, horizontal or the Y direction. And you can see it's, uh, the lowest frequency here is a, is a torsional mode of the uh, vertical plate. So that was gotten by roving in a, a triaxial accelerometer. There's a what I'd call a first bending, top and bottom plates, and then torsion of the top and bottom, maybe out of phase. Uh, so we give names to these. Here's a, here's a first bending, but out of phase as opposed to this one where they're in phase. So even with a simple three aluminum plates bolted together with cap screws here, we get some interesting looking mode shapes. I'll just walk through the rest of these. Another torsional mode, uh, another bending mode, and as I go up in frequency, the uh, bending and twisting gets more complex. Uh, you can see here we have kind of an out of phase and then an in phase bending of the two plates and uh, more complicated, maybe second bending, uh, although it's, uh, it's bending in the, in the back plane. Uh, you can see here you know, we're running into something called uh, spatial aliasing. We don't really have enough measurements on this structure to define the mode shapes any more accurately than, than you're seeing them here at the 33 points. So it's starting to look kind of wooden in the way the bending is occurring. The real structure was, of course, bending uh, more smoothly. Okay, so let me stop that. And, uh, and now we're going to look at putting some springs on this gem beam between the top and the bottom plates. And we're going to see what happens to the mode shapes of the gem beam when we put a very stiff spring between the top and bottom plates. So we're going to start over here in the corner. Let me just show the various springs. So I'm up here selecting my uh, current object type. And uh, now you can see that I have a spring over here. And it's there it is between the top and bottom plate. and I just need to give it a stiffness property. So here is my FEA property. You can see all these springs have a, a, a stiffness property called spring one. Well, where did I define that? I need to go over under FEA properties. And here are a number of different properties. And here is spring one. Let me make this a little larger. So you can see there's some other springs in here, but here's one called spring one, and it's got a million pounds per inch of stiffness. So that's a very stiff spring. That means if I compress that spring over here on the, 
on the uh, between top and bottom plate. It would take a million pounds to compress it one inch. Very stiff. Now I'm going to run a macro program and show you the influence of that spring on the gem beam. So I'm going to come up here and push this button right here that says one spring. And that's going to do a number of things and we can repeat it as many times as we like. Once the macro program is set up, uh, let me turn that off and turn this off and so now you can see a comparison of the structure over here on the left with the spring attached. The structure on the right is the unmodified uh, or the uh, gym beam without the spring attached. Over here we have two shape tables. The one on the top says modified modes. The one on the bottom says EMA modes. Those are the ones that we were looking at previously. And this program has also turned on something called Maximum Mac. So what it's going to do when I click up here on one of these shapes in the modified table, it's going to find the shape in the EMA mode shape table that has the maximum Mac value. Uh, remember Mac, and here it is displayed right here. You can see it's 100%. MAC values, that stands for Modal Assurance Criterion. MAC values go between 0 and 1, and that's a numerical measure of how similar two shapes are to one another. A better way of saying it, more mathematical, is that they are collinear. So if I could plot these shapes on a straight line, they would lie basically on this straight line with each other. They can have different magnitudes. Mode shapes don't really have magnitudes, although when we do some scaling, they will. In this case, they are uh, scaled so that we can use SDM properly. Uh, but these two are matched up 100%. So no influence. What this is saying is that the spring had no influence on that first mode. The 165 hertz is still there, and the, the stiffener is because it's just along the length of the spring it is not really affecting uh, the, the structure at all. I'm going to click on the second one. Okay, same thing. You can see down here it moved to the second mode and up here in the modified we still have the same frequency and the same mode shape and the MAC value is 100%. So that spring had no effect on that particular mode. Now we're going to go to the third one. And here's where we start to see the influence of the spring. Now that stiffener has created a brand new mode on the left and the closest correlation that it comes with the mode on the right is 80, 86, 68, sorry, 68 percent. Uh, maybe if I drag this down here to the bottom we can see it a little better. 68% uh, correlation between those two. So there was no, uh, this is a brand new mode. There, there is no mode on the unmodified that matches up better than that. Let's go to the next one. There's a, there's a match. Again, the MAC values is 100%, and uh, that mode was not affected by the stiffener. Let's go to the next one. Same thing. 100% and you can see that I have a mode at 635, up here at 634.8, it really didn't change. And here's, a, here's another mode that is brand new with this modification. You can see on the left, we haven't seen that mode before and the closest that it correlates with one on the right is 52%, but clearly it's a different mode shape. Uh, there's another higher frequency, uh, 1200 hertz, and we still have the 1200 hertz down here below. So, and here's a mode that's almost the same. It's 93% the same. You can see a little bit of stiffness over on the on the uh, left side of the structure, 
and the rest of the mode shape correlates pretty well with one of the unmodified. Finally, the last one in there is the 1500 hertz mode, not affected by that spring at all, 100%. Now, there's one more mode in here, and it's number 10, and you can see that it's really unrealistic because that spring is having no effect at that frequency on that particular, uh, on, the, on the mode at, or on the structure at that frequency. You can see the frequency is, uh, let me spin this a little, it's 9,500 hertz. So that, that mode has shifted way out to a higher frequency because there are no more modes in this modal model. Now we know that any realistic structure will have more modes. Uh, we like to say DC to daylight. Uh, many more modes in a real structure. But we have a truncated model here. We only have 10 modes in the unmodified so that the SDM algorithm, in order to compensate for the fact that this is a real stiffener put between uh, top and bottom plate on a real structure, uh, it shifted that one mode way out to a high frequency and we just call that a computational mode. All right, let me move on and uh, let's go to two springs now. And I, I pushed another hot key and now we can see that we have two springs and we got a new set of modes in the modified mode list up here on the top. Uh, the first mode is still the 165, so those two springs did not change the first 165 hertz. They, did, they weren't affected uh, or didn't affect that mode. Let me click on the second one. Okay, that mode is still there also. So we've gotten uh, two modes that were not affected. Now the third mode is the 492. Remember from the first case, we had a mode at 440, which was a brand new mode shape. That mode is now gone. This, these two springs have removed that mode from the, the modified structure. Let's go on here and see what else we have. Well, we have one at 635. That one also was in the unmodified structure. But you can see here that I'm on mode number four in the modified and number six down here in the unmodified. So we've eliminated two of the modes with those very stiff springs. Ah, here's, here's a brand new mode, brand new mode shape. Number five is a mode that we haven't seen before. And now we're starting to see the influence of those two springs. And it correlates not very well, but only 40, uh, 46 percent with one of the unmodified. Let me go ahead and click down here and there is a new mode shape. Again, it doesn't correlate well with any of the unmodified. That's a new mode shape. And here's a mode shape that was not affected by those two springs. The 1200 hertz is still part of the modified structure. And 1500 hertz is still there. Now we have two computational modes, one at 8100, another at 12,000. So the more modification we apply to the structure, the more uh, we end up with computational modes. We can see there that's not a realistic mode shape, and neither is this one. All right, let's go one more time and go to the four spring case now. And here I'm going to uh, add four springs to the front end of the structure. And we can see the crisscrossing of those two springs finally eliminated the 165 hertz, the torsional mode. Down here, see if I click on this down here, there it is, but there's nothing that correlates very well with it. So let me click back up here on this one. There is the first mode of the structure now at 227. And we certainly can see the influence of those. Uh, that was at 224 in the unmodified. And now uh, we're seeing a very stiff 
And here is a MO that correlates quite well with the unmodified uh, 82%, but it's still those springs have stiffened up uh, the uh, active edge of the, the two beams. There's a mode that's 99% correlated with the unmodified. Uh, here's a brand new mode, very stiff now. Those cross springs uh, are stiffening up the end of the beam. There's another one, brand new mode, um, 900 hertz. There's one at 1200, not really, that's a new mode also. 1500, there it is, the 1500 hertz mode, not affected by uh, those springs. And now we have three computational modes. All right, so let's go back here. I had one other command in here, which is a flip sign. Now that is a command uh, in animation where I can flip the sign if I want to overlay these two. See, these are 99%. So if I, if I drag this scroll bar down here on the bottom, there is what the two mode shapes look like when they're overlaid. And you can see what a 99% correlation between the two shapes looks like. Now, sometimes the sign of one mode shape will be flipped 180 degrees from the other. Uh, even though these are complex modes, they're what we would say virtually a normal mode. But if I push this button up here uh, that says flip sign, uh, this other hot key, you can see that it flipped the sign of the right hand mode shape. So that's a handy button to have when I'm comparing mode shapes from two different tables. Uh, that's also a standard command in the animate menu down here under comparison. Uh, flip the right sign. So that's all that hotkey is doing for me. I just put it up here because it's a little more convenient to reach up there and do that. Okay, let me go back to the, the single spring and and I'm going to stop this now, and we're going to look at something a little different. I'm going to use this command up here called modal sensitivity. Now this works the problem in reverse. Uh, let's let's run this case again so that we can see what one spring did here. So there is a single spring, and remember the first mode or the third mode here was a brand new mode of 440. So that was the first one that was created by that stiff spring. But now I wonder whether I could also create a mode at 440 with less stiffness than a million pounds. How much stiffness does it take to push the third mode to, you know, get a new set of modes with 440 being the the, the third one? So that's the question we can answer with uh, modal sensitivity. All right, it's just popped the dialog box here. Now I'm not running a macro. I'm just going to execute the command itself. It says uh, the FE objects will be used, uh, one FEA spring, and now I'm going to use the unmodified, the EMA modes. It says select unit modal mass mode shapes for the unmodified structure. Uh, warning, the mode shapes must animate correctly because SDM is using the animation equations to evaluate uh, components of the mode shape as part of its calculation. All right, here it says here you've got mode selected. Over here I've got one selected. Uh, well, down here in the, in the EMA, I'm going to say unselect them all. Now let's take a look at this window here because this is the modal sensitivity window. And what I want to do is here are the current modal frequencies of the EMA shapes and current damping. Here's some targets 
I want to set this target frequency at 440 because that's the modified frequency that I want my, my solution to achieve by varying the stiffness of the spring. Now down here the current value is a million pounds, uh, million pounds per inch. I'm going to run this thing now with a minimum value of 10,000 pounds up to a maximum value of 2 million. And I want to see which solution of the property here, the stiffness property, will get me the closest to uh, between my solution frequency and the 440 hertz. So I've selected this mode shape pair here. I don't care about the other modes. I just want to know how much stiffness is it going to take to push that third mode to 440, just like we saw over here where the million pounds did it. All right, I'm going to go up here and say go. Now it says it's going to do 100 solutions. I could ask it to do a thousand or even more, and it may have to run overnight, but you'll see with a hundred it's going to run very quickly. Bingo, it's done. Here it says it's complete. And down here it says the best solution. Now what it did is it ordered them according to a cost function, and the cost function basically was the absolute difference between the target frequency of 440 and the solution frequency. And you can see it found a solution of 440.03. And then here's the other modes in the solution. And, but it only took 50,000 pounds to come up with a solution uh, of 440. So I can run this many times. I could, I could put in, uh, let's just put in a thousand and see so what it's going to do is try uh, stiffnesses, a thousand different stiffnesses between 10,000 and 2 million, and then it's going to order the my solutions. Uh, let me scroll this scroll bar down here. So here's here are the solutions that it's that it's finding, and you can see the 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 different stiffness properties of all of these solutions. So there they are, 10 to the fifth. There's there's the best one. Here's it. You can see they're ordered from the best to the worst. Let me make this a little larger so you can see everything. So 70,000, 90,000. Well, those were the increments between uh, those values. So let's run it with a thousand now and see uh, what the answer will be. Thousand. Okay, you can see the, the solutions rattling across here, and bingo, 47848. So it actually found a solution a little bit less because I gave it more solutions to evaluate. Now that was SDM running uh, all those cases, so it's, a, it's an exhaustive search. And now it came up with a 439.99. Let's save that solution. I'm going to save it. And let's just call it a new file. And we'll call it uh, uh, one spring. And uh, 47. So there it is, 47,000. So I can just go ahead and animate this. Let me close this. And I'll put this as my source. And now let's just animate. Let's do a comparison. So there it is. And let me uh, put the modified down. I'm arranging my windows here a little bit. So up, up here on the top is the 165. 
and that's still there. That spring didn't change anything. There's the 224, and here's the 440 right there. And that's the one that only took the 47,000. Now, that might have not been the optimum one. It might have been uh, one that was a little less optimum than the uh, 47,000 pounds. But you can see that SDM, the solution there, was a whole lot less than a million pounds, and I still was able to, uh, to push that mode. All right. Let's go to the next demo. This one is going to be a substructuring problem. I want to open this and I'll say no to save that project. I'm going to open a new project. And I have some new hotkeys here. So let's go, if we have time at the end, I'll go back and show you how some of these macro programs were constructed. But there's essentially a series of emiscope commands that once they're set up, it's a program and I can just press a hotkey and ask emiscope to do something. So there's a lot of things going on here. Now we had this, this same project uh, a couple of months ago where we talked about shape expansion and uh, curve fitting a modal model to some ODS data, some operational data. Let me bring up some pictures here so we can talk about how we took this data. Let me open this. So here's a little bit of a fuzzy picture, but this is this is a picture of the experimental setup of this, what we call a VTEC rotor kit. So it's a variable speed rotor where we can simulate on balance. We can uh, do some misalignment with these. We can do, um, well, a number of other things, bearing faults. But this is a nice simple one, a variable speed. You can see down here at the bottom is a tachometer. So we and this tachometer is, works just like an accelerometer. Uh, we can power it from the analyzer uh, with uh, ICP power. And it will give us a tach signal that we can track in emiscope to obtain the frequency uh, or the RPM, uh, the rotation RPM. So what we're looking at here in the picture is what we call an order tracked ODS. So let me come back to that. Let's look at some of the other pictures here. You can see there's eight accelerometers. Well, it's clear, you, you can see them more clearly here on the model, but the blue cubes are the accelerometers that we used. And you can see they're oriented exactly the way they were when we took the data. Uh, this one here was at 45 degrees, and the other ones were all in different orientations uh, based on how the wires came off of them. So you can see the x direction would be different for each of these and the y. The z would be pretty much vertical. There's another picture. Backside, again, there's six accelerometers, triaxials on the base plate, and one each on the bearing blocks. Here's a picture of our vibrant portable hardware. This is the uh, a box that we now sell. At vibrant technology and it's got a computer in there running emiscope under program control and this one is a 24 channel version so each of these uh, eight channel multi-pin connectors there's four on the top four on the bottom they're all numbered and I can plug those into the side of the box so this is this particular box gives us uh, 24 channels of data so that's how many we needed to take the data on the VTEC rotor. Now, 8 times 3 is 24. So what about the tachometer? Well, we in fact left off the one of the directions of one of the excels and 
what we're doing here is using uh, a modal model. We're curve fitting that data. Uh, again, 20, 23 channels of data uh, with a modal model. So I'm going to go into that. I'll come back to that and we'll look at this in more detail. But I want to show you how we built the modal model to do the animation on the left. Now the animation on the right is simply using the 23 degrees of freedom from the accelerometers and animating the picture using uh, our geometric interpolation. So this model has been set up with geometric interpolation of all the other points uh, based on the motion of the eight accelerometers. The one on the left, however, is a curve fit of a modal model of the base plate and bearing blocks to the experimental data, and then the rest of it, the rotating parts and so forth, are interpolated from the modal model. So let me just show you that, and then we'll come back, and we'll look at this in more detail because there's some other things going on here. Here's a MAC value, an SDI value. Over here is a what we call a participation window. This one is showing the participation of the mode shapes in the ODS that we're looking at here. This particular ODS was the 985 hertz ODS. Let me show you the FEA model. There it is. So the animation on the left is being driven by what we call an expanded ODS. And the expanded ODS was obtained by curve fitting the first 10 modes of that base plate and two bearing blocks to the ODS data, uh, the 24 degrees of freedom that we obtained experimentally. So that's how we get a nice smooth picture here on the, on the left by doing the curve fit of the modal model. All right, let me take you and show you how we did that. I'm going to go here and open up a different project. And we'll come back to this one. Now here is the, let me arrange the window so we can see here. Here is the, the model of the base plate and the two bearing blocks. You can see it's not symmetric in any sense. And the way we created this was with uh, FEA modes. Now, again, I have some hotkeys up here. And this first one says inner bearing block. So I'm going to isolate the inner bearing block and solve for its FEA mode shapes. The second one says outer bearing block will solve for its mode shapes. The third one says base plate. So we're going to solve for its mode shapes. And then we're going to attach the two bearing blocks to the base plate using SDM. And this is called substructuring. So let me take you through that first, and then we'll go back and and look at how the substructuring actually works. Let's push the first button and, and just look at, okay, so this one is an FEA command. Now this one has not been, all the parameters have not been put into the macro uh, program for this. So I can either open dialog boxes and enter them manually, which is what I'm going to do here, or if the parameters are available for this command, then I can add them to the program and it will run without opening a dialog. In this case, we open the dialog. So this is a setup, I'm going to say solve for 20 modes, rigid body offset. We'll see in a minute that we're actually going to find rigid body modes in the solution. Those are very important because the VTEC rotor is bouncing on some rubber mounts. So it's rigid body motion is part of the modal model, part of the dynamics. Maximum iterations, this solver will iterate 50 times and attempt to find the mode shapes when it converges on a set of modes. So I'm going to go ahead and 
Got some other stuff down here for damping. We can put we can put that what's called proportional damping on the model. We're not going to use that here because we're only interested in the mode shapes themselves. We're not even interested in their frequencies, just the shapes. And then we'll go back to the previous project and curve fit those mode shapes to the ODS data to obtain an expanded ODS which we animate. All right, let's go ahead and do that now. It's finished, very fast algorithm. FEA have been calculated, and I'm going to save those in the inner FEA shape table. So I just want to replace those. Now it's saying, warning, some of the following objects are selected, the substructures, and I'll say, do you want to unselect them? And yes, we'll unselect. And now we have a picture of the, the inner bearing block and over here we have its shape table with its mode shapes in it. And you can also see the the solid elements. Now these were solids. This is a very simple model to build in ME scope uh, by extruding an outline of the bearing block uh, and then adding the solids to it. So I already had these solid elements as part of this model and I hid the other ones and so it's just using the elements of this bearing block and these are the first six rigid body modes. So these are the rigid body modes of this bearing block just floating in space and there is the first flexible mode. It's a torsion mode. And there's the next one, first bending. This is what we expect to see from a simple geometry like this. And uh, this, these are aluminum solid elements. So we put all the properties for aluminum into these elements. And uh, let me just show you where that occurs. Uh, let me stop this for a minute and we'll start it again. Up here, FEA materials. So we chose aluminum, and here are the handbook values for uh, aluminum, and uh, and then also the FEA properties for the solids. So all they have in them are the aluminum material, and then their geometry determines. Uh, how they participate or how they contribute to each of the mode shapes. So this is a number of solid elements here and this is this is FEA and you can see as we go up in frequency I've got 20 of them in here and as I go up in frequency uh, they get more complex in terms of the bending and twisting of the mode shapes. All right so there is the inner block bearing block. Let me push on this hot key and this is going to do the outer bearing block. So now I want to hide the inner and concentrate on solving for the outer. And I'm going to replace the outer FEA modes. And again it says you had things selected. And here are the outer. So a little different looking but basically six rigid body modes and then a torsional mode and a bending mode. All right, let's go to the third one. So now we have the modes of the inner and outer bearing. Let's go to the base plate and let's solve for its mode. So the way the FEA and SDM work is that only operate on visible objects. So even though all of the other elements are on the on the base plate and bearing blocks, we hid those so that they don't enter into the calculation. And again, we have the base plate in free space. And there's the first bending mode. First torsion mode, second torsion, second bending, there's bending in the stiff direction, and 
we run out of names. Now we just have to use the frequency of, of the base plate. So we've got 20 modes for the base plate, 20 modes for each of the bearing blocks. Now let me simply push the, the final key here, which is SDM, the final hot key, and uh, let's look at the results. So again, it says, do you want to unselect the objects? Yes. And those are just the substructures. And here are the modes of the combined base plate and bearing blocks. So how did we attach them? Well, just like with the gem beam, we attached the bearing blocks to the base plate with very stiff springs. So this is a real advantage of, of SDM because if you look closely, the points on this on the two models do not match up. So if I were to just use an FEA solver, I would have to make sure that the points on the bearing blocks matched up with the points or nodes on the base plate. With SDM, you can you can kind of see those springs down there, those stiff springs now. I'm going to stop this in a minute and we'll see the, the little red lines because we use 36 stiff springs and a, a better way to say is that they are stiffeners in the X, Y, and Z direction between each of the bearing blocks and the base plate. So SDM can model, oh, let me turn that off and just turn the points on. So you can see here a little better and I'll even turn off the surfaces. Well, that doesn't help, but you can see that the base plate and the bearing blocks do not match up uh, in terms of their node points. SDM, though, will take care of uh, attaching them. So this is substructuring. Now, the program rattled through and put all the mode shapes together in a single shape table. And this modified shape table now has 60 modes in it. You can see that they go all the way up here to 60. And let me just go back and click here because we still got a rigid body. We'll have six rigid body modes of the bearing blocks on the. And there is our first bending mode. So there are the bearing blocks just bending with the base plate. And there's our first torsion mode. Again, a, a kind of an asymmetrical because of the, the weight and the stiffness of those bearing blocks. And here's the third mode. And so there's a, there are the first 10 modes. Now what we did with these 10 mode shapes in the previous project, we took that modal model with those 10 modes in it and we curve fit that to the experimental ODS data. And that's how we were able to expand the ODS uh, through the least squares curve fit to all of the degrees of freedom of this, uh, this modal model here. And you can see, I mean, we can just keep going here, but we're just going to use the first 10. So if I use too many of them, you, you'll see that we get into a lot of local bending here. And the VTEC machine really was not, not bending that much. But we had the first six rigid body modes and then four of the flexible body modes in our modal model. Let's look down here and just look at how many degrees of freedom these mode shapes have. Okay, almost 2,000, 1,938 degrees of freedom. So quite a bit of data that we can readily get from building simple FEA models and then attaching them with the springs. Let me show you the springs here just before we leave here. And I'm going to go over to, I'll select FEA springs as my current objects and here they are there's 36 of them and if I 
turn them on here, and then let me also turn on uh, their labels. So there they are. Now you can see, let me make this even larger, you can see the springs that were attached. Now there's actually spring 20, there's, there's actually three of them here. So let me draw those out, and then you can see that each one of those springs that are attached between those two points is going to stiffen the structure in the X and then in the Y and then in the Z. So here's 19 and 20. So let's go over here in the spreadsheet and we can see how those springs were defined. Okay, they all have the property of spring one, which is the million pounds. Again, we use the same million pounds, a very stiff spring. Uh, there it is, a million pounds of stiffness. So that's plenty of stiffness to attach those springs. And if we look down here at spring, uh, well, you can see they're actually grouped. Here are all the X's, and here's some Y's, and here's some Z's. And then the second bearing block has X's, Y's, and Z's. Make that a little bit bigger so we can see it. You can see that uh, here's spring one through spring six. That's over here on the on the other bearing block here. So we've got a spring one in the X, a spring one in the Y spring one in the Z. So that's how the stiffeners were added between the, the uh, substructures. Okay, let's go back. We've got a few minutes left here. I want to go back to the VTEC model, the animating ODS, and we'll just talk a few minutes more about how we use this modal model and, uh, and what we're doing here to make the animation follow the, the experimental data on this machine. So on the left is the curve fit of the modal model to the experimental data from 23 degrees of freedom. On the right is the raw data itself, and the model is simply interpolated geometrically uh, between the accelerometer locations. Up here we're looking at two different measures between the, the ODS uh, data on the right and the expanded ODS data on the left. So this is an indication of how well the curve fit actually fit the modal model, the 10 modes, to the experimental ODS data. And you can see, and then there's, a, there's something called the SDI, and that's a shape difference indicator, a little bit different than the MAC, uh, something unique to Emiscope and Vibrant. Uh, we've talked about it in the past. Uh, that is a measure between 0 and 1 that tells not only whether they're collinear, but how close they are numerically the two shapes to each other. So each of the components uh, being the same. Down here is what we call modal participation. So I'll put that right up here in the middle. Above is the expanded ODS at 985. Below is the uh, experimental ODS at 985. This picture in the middle is showing of the 10 FEA mode shapes, which ones actually were curve fit to the experimental data and how much. So you can see here that the modes two and three participated the most in this particular mode shape, or this particular ODS, I mean. You can see there's very little of the flexible modes. The flexible modes are over here, the higher numbered ones, uh, seven through let me make this a little larger so we can take a good look at it here. So here's 
here's mode number one, and uh, again the frequency doesn't matter. It, it, the, the shape was uh, it was at 100 RPM, and the actual ODS is at 985. But this is showing the participation. So of the of the six modes, you can see the participation of them. And then there's four flexible modes here, not a whole lot of participation. Let's go to the next speed, 1440. This is a different running speed of this machine. And you can see the ODS changed quite a bit. And I'll put this up here again. Oh, let, me, let me do this one more time. We'll just put it back up again. So now, here's the main participation, and it was mode number five. So whatever that rigid body mode looked like, it's now dominating, and then there's two other rigid body modes. Not much participation from the flexible modes, these four right here. So there's not much flex in this. It's, it's really just bouncing on, on its rubber mounts. Let's go to the next speed, 2200. Okay, well now we've got quite different motion here. And again, a different participation, a little more flex of this higher frequency here included in the, in the uh, ODS. And it, up here we, we see that the Experimental data and the expanded shape are 94% alike, and even numerically they're very similar. So what these numbers are showing us is the comparison of the curve fit or the expanded uh, 2280 RPM ODS versus the experimental data down here, which is 2280 uh, for 23 degrees of freedom. So that is pretty much what we want to demonstrate here. If I just look at the, you can see a little flex in here because there's some there's some torsional motion here to this uh, to the one on the left. Uh, if we just animate the one on the left, maybe we can see it a little better. And here it is. Uh, you can see. And if I go back and just push one of these buttons. Here's the 900 hertz. Uh, okay, it put me back with the dual display. Let me put it on a single display. There you can see that it's, it's just rocking on the rubber mounts at that speed. And if I go back up here to the higher speed, uh, I start to see some participation of, uh, of the flex. little bit of flex due to the the outboard and in fact we had some out we had some unbalance on this outboard rotor so that's causing this this end of the machine to uh, to move around a little bit okay that's the end of the discussion Brian do we have any questions uh, no we don't all right well with that We'll wrap up this uh, webinar, and uh, we'll look forward to having some of you back next month where we'll cover a different topic. It will be announced in our, our newsletter here in uh, several weeks when we've decided uh, what we're going to show. The other thing I might mention is that these three projects uh, will be sent to you. Uh, you can run them with, uh, in your Emmy scope. And uh, just by pressing the hot keys, uh, we didn't have a chance today to get into the uh, macro programming. It's quite simple. Uh, if you get these projects and, and uh, open them up and look at the macro programs, you'll, you'll get a better understanding of how, how we do that in Emmyscope. Okay, I'll say so long until next month then. <laughs>